And we're back online for our last presentation of the day. Um, welcome back, everybody. I'm very pleased to be joined by Hannah Domido. Did I pronounce your name well? That's correct. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've been struggling today with a lot of different nationality names, trying to <laughs> figure out how to say them all. And um, Hannah, you, what are you going to be showing us today? Um, so I am more on the user side. So how, how do I use QGIS for work and art? Um, so a little bit about me. I am Hannah Dermido. I am a graphics reporter and cartographer for the Washington Post. Um, I used to work for Bloomberg in Hong Kong for five years. I'm currently in Manila, figuring out like all this like moving in the middle of a pandemic thing. <laughs> <laughs> but making maps while I figure out life. Um, so thank you for hanging out with us today and I'm happy you know, to share what I can and hopefully you'll find this interesting as well. Um, Great. I, um, Hannah, just before you kick off, um, so mm -hmm. if anybody's got questions, would you like us to wait for the end or would you like us to interrupt you? Interrupt away. Okay, so anybody in the live chat, you can ask your questions and I'll, um, I will sort of forward them over to Hannah as, as a good opportunity in the conversation arises, yeah. And otherwise we'll just sit back and uh, let you do your thing. Thank you. Okay, so what you're seeing now are some of my favorite maps that I've done for, for work. Um, I plan this to be more casual um, so it's going to be basically show and tell. So I am going through, like, why why do I make maps? Like, I am a journalist. I'm a graphics reporter. Why do I use QGIS? So we use maps to, you know, tell stories and make them more interesting. And that's what I'm here for. So a little bit about me. I did not start out as a cartographer. I do not have um formal training if you may say so <laughs> no i do not have formal training um in cartography or gis i am a traditional journalist by training but at some point i found myself um transitioning to database to graphics and now i um, do maps almost every day of my life which is really really fun um, so let me show you why we make maps um, and why do we put them in stories. So here are some of my favorite um, stories with maps when I used to work with Bloomberg. Um, this is a story about the South China Sea. And that was like a big uh, beat when I was in Hong Kong for Bloomberg. And we use maps to basically like pull the story together. Like a lot of people know that, okay, South China Sea is like somewhere in Asia, but I think like a lot of our readers do not really have a good grasp of where exactly is this. So maps are very important um, in a way to like pull that story together, like put your readers um, in context of where exactly is this. So for example, in this first map that you see, we try to tell a story of, you know, where this fisherman encountered Chinese vessels and we use the countries around it to give context. So people will see that, okay, yes, this is the Philippines and you have Vietnam and South China Sea is somewhere in the middle. Um, and we, you know, put the locations there to tell our story. And then, so we use like a lot of visuals to, basically like make the story more interesting, add value to it. And then we introduce more maps. So for this one, I think my favorite here, it's not, it's not an easy story to tell because for, you know, for journalists who cover this so much, like South China Sea stories um, come very often, but the challenge is how do you present it in a different manner that your readers would be interested so for us we opted for like more maps like make it a visual story so that our readers would experience the story and not just like read it um, so all of these maps that you see were made in QGIS but the final styling we did in illustrator because we 
usually do like four different sizes or five different sizes per map that just makes it interactive depending on so i'm going to show you like depending on how size how how what the size of your screen is so like the shape files the kmls all these locations are done in QGIS, but then we pull it out and do the final stuff in in Illustrator, and then we do AI to HTML and all those things to make our story more web friendly and mobile friendly and all that. So, like this is how this is like one way of using maps to tell a story, and then of course like we have other um, charts and graphics to make our story more interesting. We have lovely photos. And like for this story, I could not take the credit for the maps just by myself because I had a partner, um, Adrian Lung, uh, who was my partner at Bloomberg in Hong Kong, like did help me a lot with like the styling and like pulling the story together. So this is like a collaboration, but usually the QGS stuff would be um, my assignment. That's my huge contribution. Um, this next story, um, also done at Bloomberg. Like this has my favorite maps ever. Because um, I feel like, aside from adding value to the story, I feel like they're just really, really beautiful maps. And that sounds really odd, like just you know singing praises to my own stuff. But again, this is a collaboration of, um, uh, with Adrian and then Cynthia Hoffman from the New York um, team to like get all of these like maps in and this beautiful shape. So we mapped the food choke points all over the world. Um, so I used um, a lot of natural earth um, data for this and I just pulled all of them and in, in QGIS and then styled it in Illustrator. And here's another one. I think this is my favorite because I think this was the first time that I really used bathymetry for my maps. Um, I didn't really understand what it was before this um, because I usually like learn as I go. So for this one, it was more of like we were trying to show how deep or how shallow the areas were like for example like this is a very small canal and um, a lot of the supply chain um in and places in you know north america and south america rely on this for stuff to go through to asia they sometimes pass through the panama canal as well so we wanted to show like which parts are deep and which parts are not so deep and i feel like that played a very important role for, for this map. But yeah, but because I didn't really know what they were, like I had to like Google and understand like, how do you work with this data set? Um, how do you visualize it and stuff like that? So for me, like a lot of the maps that I work on, um, at this point I have a pretty good grasp of, you know, mapping and the concepts and all of that. But for me, like every day is still like a learning process, which is, um, for me, the most exciting part of the job, aside from the output. So we have more maps here. Um, I want to move on to another favorite. Um, so this is the first time that I realized that you can map Moon or Mars in QGIS, and that just blew my mind. Um, I, I was able to achieve this by tweeting and asking people to send me tutorials, please. Because I didn't really know that you can actually do this, um, but I, I've i seen people map the moon, but I didn't understand like how you can do it. And I think that was another like QJS milestone for me, just doing like mapping something that's not part of the earth. I have not ma mapped Mars yet, and but that's another thing that I really want to do. Can you tell us um, a, a little bit about the data? Is it a Restus data set um, with like one side of the moon on each um, yeah. coverage or how does it? How did you get the data? I actually can't remember. 
um, off the top of my head because it's like a few a few years back. But I remember we had to stitch them. Um, we got a few uh, raster data sets and we had to stitch um, them together in QGIS, which is quite easy to do. Um, but this is like, this is the dark, ish side of the moon well the far mm -hmm. side of the moon that china recently was able to get um what do you call them like stuff from um, stuff samples yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's sorry that's moon funny. dust from, <laughs> um uh, yeah so i don't really remember but i think it this quite this took me quite a long time because it was more of like figuring out how to stitch them together, how to make sure. I've never mapped something that was like not Earth coordinates. So that was also another challenge. But I can't and, tell you now. <laughs> and can you tell us like, um, did you did you take it out of QGIS and then put it into Photoshop afterwards or some similar tool? Or did you do everything that we're seeing here in QGIS, including the, the glow and the... No, this is Illustrator. So okay. what we did was we had this one big map. Um, you can actually add the glow in QGIS, but mm -hmm. we did more styling outside. Um, and then it's also because for us, we have more um, skills in Illustrator and Photoshop, and it's good to like you know make the most out of this other skills because mm -hmm. we don't. You know, QGIS is very powerful, but sometimes like it's hard to keep up <laughs> and for yeah. us like it's it's hard to like you know add this little bits and pieces that i saw niall do before like he just added all these glow and he had made things move and all that which is amazing but then for us like, especially if you're in a deadline what we would do would be like do the basics like do the fast stuff in QGIS, and then pull it out um, and then do more tweaks in illustrator mm -hmm. I think that's it. And you have like more stuff here, but they're not really maps. So that's how the maps fit in, um, in, in new stories or feature stories. And then I have a few more here. I, I can share the link later, but I don't know if you can open them if you're not subscribed to Bloomberg. So I'm just going to pull them up. So some of the biggest stories that I worked on um, the past few years was the Hong Kong protests. And for us, this was like a very fast paced story that was you know we did not know what to expect like it was developing very quickly and what i did was i started a base in QGIS and just pulled everything that we can um, in terms of like preparing the base and styling the base um, and just having that in case something breaks and and that was quite useful um, eventually because of how that um, turned out uh, and these are like some of the maps that came out of that. Um, this, I think a lot of these were open street map as well. And there are some of like open data. There's not a lot of open data stuff in Hong Kong, but we were able to like pull out some districts and um, just the base of it. But a lot, we really relied on um, open street map for this. Um, the routes that you're seeing, though, we added them manually in Illustrator because it was more of we have the base prepared and then we needed to get the story out. So the base, the base map, like the, the water and the land and the um, scale and all that, we have prepared way before in QGIS, pulled it out in Illustrator. And then when things started happening, like we just added you know bits and pieces so that we can publish it very quickly because of like the pressure of the deadline um, and these were also pulled out um, we used open street map but a lot of things were not updated so um, on top of like what was available for us in open street map we had to manually trace and fix 
the shapes, the buildings um, that we know existed but are not yet available in the data. Um, that was quite good because, of course, like we were, you know, we were on the ground, we knew the location. I worked with a lot of local reporters who had a very good grasp of, you know, what's happening on the ground. So we were able to like tweak um, the the shore. The shoreline was usually not um, not correct, just because. I think there's been a lot of um, changes that the government has been doing, like reclaiming the you know, parts of the sea, which does not really, at that time, did not show in the data set. So we had to like, fix that. Um, but uh, but we really relied on QGIS and OpenStreetMap and just pulling that in um, to tell the story. So this was in Hong Kong. Um, so for us, um, I rely heavily in QGIS for mapping, um, other people use T3 um, and all of that, but I'm a QGIS girl through and through. So a lot of my maps like would really, really er be done in QGIS. So that's, oh, let me just pull up something um, that I've done at the post. So I'm quite new at the Washington Post. I have not really done so much, but this is a cool story that I worked on recently um, that shows you uh, the drought situation in Northern mm, uh, it looks America. looks beautiful. Thank you. So this is like um, one of my first few stories at, at the post and hopefully I can do more <laughs> um, soon. Yeah, and then I have another map down here. So these are QGIS maps. Um, there are maps that sometimes we do not have data for. So it's either we ha we uh, manually pull them into QGIS and uh, geo-reference it, or sometimes if you don't have time, then you just trace it. But for me, what's very useful is like geo-referencing the data so that you have it and you can save it and then eventually you can reuse it. Did you do um, the legend in, in Illustrator for that one? This one is Illustrator, yes. Yeah. This one. So, yeah. So a lot of it, you know, the base, this one had a lot of Illustrator styling as well, just to add like those little shadows and all of that, like fixing the locations. And then we use AI to HTML um, to pull it to our, uh, to our page. So start in QGIS and then print it out as an SVG and then do the final touches in Illustrator. Mm -hmm. And then this one, um, my colleague, um, Laris, made these maps. I'm not sure if they're QGIS, um, but they're pretty anyway. I did trace, um, so the Secret Service gave us uh, data, but they were like lines. Uh, no, they, they gave us the street names. They did not release the data. So what I did was I traced, I manually traced the streets on Google My Maps and I pulled them into QGIS to, to check it out with my base. So um, I I mix and match <laughs> my, my tools. So uh, but QGIS is always on the floor of that. So those are some of my favorite maps that I made for work. Um, so what, um, if, I, if I had um, like a grant a wish <laughs> um, for you, uh, what things in Q, would you like to change in QGIS to make your work easier? Or is there, are there any things that you think, oh, geez, if I could just have X, Y, Z <laughs> work for me in QGIS, my life would be a lot oh, easier. That would That'd be amazing. I should have asked my team uh, before. Um, but I think um, one of the problems that I encounter a lot is it still crashes. Um, and I don't know why. I'm not very good with like bugs and stuff like that. But sometimes QGIS just crashes on you. And I don't know if it's, you know, something that I pulled in or I don't know. Um, uh, one thing that would be good to have um, is pulling in, uh, no, like loading DEMs 
directly. I mm -hmm. tried a plugin. I don't know if it still works. Is that TM, <laughs> is that TM loaded plugin? I think so. S oh no, I think it's an SRT. Um, S there's an STR SRTM plugin mm -hmm. in QGIS that um, used to work. I haven't tried it recently, but sometimes it doesn't work. Um, I'm not yet sure what's good to have, but I think I, my, my team has a list and we would love <laughs> to share uh, feedback with you uh, if that mm. helps at all. Um, what's really, really good though um, that I've been enjoying recently is using Map Tyler. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how useful that is for people, but um, can I share? Oh, it's going to be a blank QG screen. Give me a sec. Oops. While, so, you put, while you're opening up QGIS, somebody has got a question um, asking you if the news agency generally has guidelines on your color usage, so your, your choice of your palettes, is it, is it um, mandated or is it your own free choice, like how you compose the color palettes for your, for your maps? Uh, usually we have a guide, um, but that's, again, you have to you know, know the rules so you can break it properly. Um, like for, we usually have like a color for the land and what do we want, the sea color, the fonts and all that, but mm -hmm. it also changes per story. So it's not very, you're not required to just stick with that, but these mm -hmm. are, you know, your go-to colors. But right. for example, for the, um, the WAPO story that I showed you, the drought story. So some of those colors are not really like part of our, guide colors but then again you adjust on like what story are you trying to tell what works with your data like what feel are you trying to go for so mm -hmm. you, know, you have rules but then you have to like you know learn the rules to know how to break them properly and just quickly drew french is also asking if you usually um, output to svg or pdf I do SVGs. Um, I know like my team at WAPO used to do PDFs, but then SVG works for me better because they can be grouped. So when you export um, and then it renders them in layers. So like all your location dots are in layers, all your countries are in one group. So it's easier for me to, to edit them. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I encounter bugs there. Um, I'm not sure if someone else has, but um, I think it's it's the shape file that might be problematic and not QGIS, QGIS itself. But sometimes the SVG does not render as polygons, like some of the mm -hmm. bits are missing. But when that happens, I pull it into Map Shaper and then um, try to like merge whatever and simplify it and then pull it back to QGIS and usually that that helps fix it. Mm -hmm. I know before, like, I don't know if my, my editor is listening, but Tim used to I, I ask a question before, because sometimes when we try and print out a small location in QGIS, um, it doesn't, like it when you export it as SVG, it shows you the whole base. Um, right. And and I'm not sure if you know if we're doing something wrong. Is there like a setting that we can do? But sometimes that's a very heavy file. Mm. The so Illustrator it doesn't is not to your map about. composition. No, it doesn't. Like it gives you everything. I think it also mm. depends on the projection. Um, mm. If it's um, like projections that are you know very specific to like locations in the U.S., for example, um, sometimes it doesn't really clip it which is, I'm not sure what we're doing <laughs> wrong. Mm -hmm. um, uh, somebody there, else wanted, um, Chaplin, just while we're asking questions, also asked, um, uh, Chaplin, sorry, I don't know if you're um, male or female, but they want to ask, I uh, <laughs> want to know uh, if you do, um, she said, oh, they say, I've always wanted to do pieces for data journalism, but never found a good entry point. So in general, is the field open for scientists dipping their toes into foreign water? I honestly think it is. So um, a lot of us come from very diverse backgrounds um, and expertise, like 
you know, if you're a scientist would be very, very helpful. I just, I'm not entirely sure how um, at this point, like for me, for example, my entry to, it, it might be quite different, but like my entry to cartography was really through inserting myself in conversations, <laughs> which sounds really <laughs> odd, but, but honestly, like that's how it happened. Um, I needed to learn the skill because I was trying to like specialize and learn like data journalism. But again, like I'm not a scientist. I know how to write and cover and all of these things, but you know, I like a jack of all trades, but you know, if, if I have to write about the climate, for example, it's something that I really have to interview people uh, for to tell me like, you know, the, the scientific way of things. And then I have to try and translate it so that, the layman or the normal reader can understand it but i feel like um you have as a scientist or another expert in another field you have um you have skills and expertise that we do not have as journalists and that would be very interesting and i feel like now you don't really have to be a journalist journalist to write um it's something that you can learn but the skills that you have would be useful for um, any organization. Um, that sounds like a very big response, just because I'm not sure like what kind of scientist you are, or you know what are you trying to achieve. But um, I think like the the first thing would be try and tell the story in a way that a non scientist would understand, because I feel like that's are the role of you know a data journalist or a, you know a cartography for new cartographer for news like we're trying to make people um, understand the data that before scientists or you know people in the academe would look at more but now we're trying to like bridge that gap of like explaining to people about hurricanes and typhoons and all these like drought for them to care about it more. Mm -hmm. Um. Sorry, people are now sending lots of questions. So, um, <laughs> okay. um, so Tiago Tiago Sosa um, says, in addition to Chaplin's uh, question, how do you think cartographers can get closer to data journalism and geojournalism? So she's hey, coming from the cartographer. <laughs> we have <Yeah>. an opening. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Um, but I honestly like people like me who are, in, who are in the news, you know, side of things and cartography, like we follow experts and we follow cartographers. And that's where I, you know, that's where I come from. Like I inserted myself by like following all these people, like GIS people and who make amazing maps. And usually it's more of, I think, try and share your your stuff on social media and that sounds very millennial but that's how we notice people like we notice your work if you share your work with us if you're working um, on something interesting and you want eyes on it um, our emails are open if um you want to join for example like qjs um groups are good that's how we notice people as well and i think that's how i was noticed as well I've also joined um, like carto cartographic groups like NASIS, um, even if I'm really in Asia. But I think that's a good point, uh, entry mm -hmm. point, like find, you know, find communities and then build networks and then share your work, like get it out there um, so people can see what you're working on and insert yourself in conversations. I think that worked quite well with me. It's not the easiest thing to do, but, you know, like, so, so Tiago, uh, Hannah, your, your portfolio, I think it um, would be wonderful if somebody gets a job out of this <laughs> session. That would be really nice. <laughs> uh, no promises, of course, but um, yeah. Um, yeah, and there was another hint from Alex, Alexandra Neto said that when you do your SVG e export, there is an option to clip the SVG. So you just want to oh, see wow. if okay. it's working for you or not, or maybe you haven't discovered that option. But um, No, I have not. But okay. I, will, I will check it out. Thank you. Yeah, you can you can pop him a note. He's on the Telegram group. You can pop him a note uh, later if you can't find it. Um, Sophia Garcia is asking you what which are your favorite plugins or tools for artistic visualization. 
Oh, that's hard. Um, well, let's I just make it simple. What, is, what are your favorite plugins? Which I see you using MapTiler plugin, but um, any other things that you like find indispensable that come, you know, as in a, in addition to what you get out of the box with QGIS? OpenStreetMap. Um, <laughs> I'm not. Let's see what I have. Not a lot. Um, this is a new install. Um, I used to play around with. Um, what was that? 3JS. I haven't done mm -hmm. it in a long time. Um, but that's one um, that I tried to like use and figure out. I'm very basic in QGIS. Um, it's more of um, data, like interpreting my data and putting it on a map, usually putting locations. I use um, you know, Hill Shader and all these like little things on the toolbox. But I am open to plugin suggestions. Um, please expand my my plugin <laughs> my, pl my plugin horizons. Um, but yeah, but I'm very very basic when it comes to QGIS so far. Um, I recently learned how to use the the assistant. Um, ah, yes, and that's I, wonderful. And yeah. that is amazing. I've seen it before, but it was so scary. <laughs> um, but my, I was working on a data that I can't share yet. I will share it once it's out. Um, I was working on it, and then my editor showed me how to use it, and my mind was blown, and it's amazing. Um, and I feel like every time I know a lot of things about QGIS, there's just so much that I don't know. Yeah, we're all on the same boat. Even though those have been <laughs> using it from the beginning, it's just uh, every day I find, oh, I didn't know you could do that. And <laughs> <laughs> same. So, okay, so you wanted to show us something here? I'll stop asking you questions so you can actually show some things again. Oh, this is just, you know, very basic, but I wanted to show people um, how, so during lockdown, I've found um, a way to amuse myself. <laughs> and that was making hand-drawn maps. So coming from, you know, no mapping training, like doing stuff by hand was scary and interesting at the same time. And again, like I use very basic stuff and I'm for this project, like this mapping, a project that I've been doing a lot. I have been doing, I've been using map Tyler and it's currently my favorite. Um, so I've been doing um, maps and people have named them for me. So I don't know if um, you've encountered it, but like this map at the back um, is a hand-drawn map that I did um, a few months back. And usually this starts as a QGIS map because I don't know how to draw a map per se. So I have to start all my projects in QGIS. So, Recently, I would, so this is the art part. Um, I don't use plugins, but I've used the styles that you can, excuse me, that you can find in QGIS, the style hub, that um, Toby and Class have been like working on. And those are very, very cool. But recently what I've been doing is just um, looking for, you know, cities that I love or cities that, I want to visit or places I want to visit or cities that mean, you know, something to me. And my recent project is mapping Hamburg um, because my dad worked in Hamburg for X number of years. And I'm trying to map the places that he's been. He worked as a seafarer for years um, before he retired. So I'm trying to like map where he's been in the world. <clears throat> So I'm starting with Hamburg and I want to do a dormido, our dormy dots map. So the, the style of the map that I do uh, by hand was given a name. Um, Topi first named it as dormido markers and then eventually it was called dormy dots and I've adopted that. Um, I just call them dormy dots. Um, so usually I start here. I love map Tyler because it gives me like all um, the stuff that I need basically in one go. And then if I export this, it's gonna give me layers. 
So this is my recent project. I'm going to show you um, a recording of how I do the maps, but I did take a shortcut on this one because I didn't have much time to prepare. So I, I traced the map instead of drawing it by hand because I had to record it for you. Because <laughs> it usually takes me hours to map it. I have to make grids and all that because, again, So when you I'm say draw by hand, you draw it sort of just by eyeballing the... Yeah, um, I would okay. I would grids um, to okay. learn better on like how how to make it, but I can't do it um, now. It'll take me days. <laughs> so this is what I do. Um, instead of eyeballing it this time, I was just like, I'm going to cheat. So I can show you the process. And then I would figure out my color palette, <laughs> like what will work and what won't work together. One thing I always admire about artists is your patience because <laughs> sitting there <laughs> drawing those little loopy circle things <laughs> for hours and yes. then you must be so patient. It takes, uh, this is not yet done. Like I just recorded it like to show people, you know, what you can do. Like it doesn't always have to end on a digital map. So it might start in QGIS, like you can either, if you have a 3D printer, you can print it out. I don't have that, but you know, that's when a nice project that you can do. So QGIS is just not, you know, it's not limited to work, but if it's, you know, it can be, you know, a starting point for another passion or, you know, more like learning more things. And for me, like, this is what I've been doing since 2020 lockdown. <laughs> So yeah, um, and then I have, like, if you're interested to see the maps that I've worked on so far, like I tweak some of them, um, but sometimes I feel like I'm spamming people so much. So I've put them in um, in an Instagram page, so an Instagram account. So if you just wanna check this out, um, mm. the first maps that I've made, um, I think this is the first one. This is Lama Island in Hong Kong where I lived. Um, this was like the starting point. I didn't really have the style um, pinned down yet. And then eventually, um, yeah, so I would map on my way to work. Oh, so usually I'm, 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 on, I'm on the ferry and then I would just sit there and like make little um, circles. Um, yeah. And it usually takes me hours. So I think this one took like 18 hours to do, uh, not on one sitting, no. <laughs> like mm. I stop and then I come back to it because it's also like very relaxing. Yeah. Um, this is That's one of the... Yeah. Thank you. Um, so QGIS and then I try and put it on paper. Uh, but, but if you don't want to do it by hand, there is a style for it. And you can find it in the QGIS. Yeah, let's, style. Show, let's advertise our style <laughs> repository a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, it's in... I think the one thing that style needs is a bit more randomness in the size of the little circle. Um, things they all come out the same size. Yeah, I've tried. Which one was that? I think the uh, Dermida rough one. I think you can edit it. There's um, also. Uh, do you know about the new style repository that we've been setting up? Um, if you go to plugins.qgis.org and then you'll see that there's a new style menu there. Let's see. So click on styles on the menu at the top. And we've been, oh, yes. uh, we set this up for sharing styles and um, if you if you go through the options, you'll probably find there you go. Yeah, that, and that was Klaus's contribution. Yes, and you There's can so download these easily can... and and just add them one by one into your QGIS. So, um, yeah, I think this one you can edit the sizes actually. Um, but I think then they will still all come out the same size, right? But in yours, oh. I was noticing that like, you're using a <laughs> it's different very size. random. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's quite random. That's what I have for for everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. But I'm happy if you have more questions for me. Yeah, you know what? There, um, there's just some comments. People are just saying, um, 
you know, uh, oh, there's one person saying that there's an interesting plugin for you to know about called Serval, S E R V A L, like the small cat, which mm -hmm. lets you hand, hand edit pixels in a raster. I th they Ooh. thought you might find that useful. And um, thank you. Uh, Luigi Pirelli says that he was very sad that he couldn't ship you out to the user conference in Acarunia, <laughs> but maybe next time. Um, maybe next time I can. Um, yeah. I would love to. <laughs> and um, and Issa, Ishibaru says that your talk proves that Arc just Pro is overrated. A good map is about creativity, not software. Q just plus Domido equals awesomeness. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much. And I do hope you'll come back and show us some, some more of what you make. And um, I want to ask you just one thing. Who, which cartographers out there do you get influenced by? And um, so if you want to sort of uh, point somebody to um, follow other, you know, your, your colleagues work in the same space. Um, who do you think are great influences? I followed a lot of, um, before I joined Washington Post, I followed a lot of their cartographers who I work with now. So that would mm -hmm. be Tim, Tim, Miko, we have Lauren, Tierney, Laris. Um, oh my God, I can't remember his name. I will tweet them. And then Tim yeah. from the New York Times. Um, they and they were using QGIS before you arrived there? Were they already, already using QGIS? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, Tim, uh, use, he knows a lot more than I do, and he's been teaching me all his tricks as well. Um, and he has his own like base and all that set up, which is really, really amazing to see. Um, at Bloomberg, we also use QGIS um, there. So it's more of, I think, a lot of us are more comfy with it because um, it's easy to ask people how to use it. Uh, we we do use other software, but I'm not very good with them. So I am sticking to what I know, and you know, I I have um, thousands of people who can provide support. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm honestly like just making you know making the most out of the community and. Um, and all of the help that I can get. So one tweet, and then you get, you know, and thousand ways of doing one thing. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it's more of, there are more than, there's always more than one way to do one thing. And I think that's amazing when, you know, you get to see how people use, you know, a plugin, how people make their own maps, um, what their process is. And again, for me, like my process is, qu is quite simple. Usually it's just a base map, and then I would pull in locations using Google My Maps, KML, drag it in, and then you have dots. And mm -hmm. and that works because I need to work in a you know fast-paced environment. Um, but then if you know if we get more time, then we would create custom relief and all these like fancy things. But you know it really depends on like the story and the deadline and how much time we have. Um, to actually work on each of the maps. Wonderful. Luigi's suggesting that we, uh, next open day or another open day, you must come and give us an open or a QGIS cartography session so that you can actually <laughs> maybe, maybe we could do something fun like have a, like a follow along, like you, um, you, you make a map and we all have our QGIS open, <laughs> but publish the data first and then we all can follow follow you along as you um, make something beautiful and we can feel like we're doing it ourselves as well. Like uh, <laughs> Bob Ross, you know Bob Ross? <laughs> yes. Bob Ross for cartography, that's what we need, yeah. <laughs> that would be fun. Yes, I'm happy to, I'm happy to come back if you're happy to have me back. Oh, of course, yes, yeah, please. So, well, thank you very much. I think we can end there and um, I know it's very late for you, for you. Thank you for staying up so late. It's, what is it now, 12 o'clock almost in, in the Philippines? It's so, almost one. Oh, even worse, okay. So, <laughs> yeah, well, it's all good, there. thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much and thank you everybody in the community for following along today for all the different talks. It's been a great ride and uh, we'll see you next month maybe if you've got the time, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye everyone.